welcome to tonight's forum. I'm Max Robbins, and I'm the executive director of the Center for Communication. And I want to express my gratitude to our speakers tonight. I know they're all extremely busy journalists and doing terrific work. Uh, we're looking forward to this conversation. Sitting next to me is Aaron Edwards. He's the mo mobile editor at BuzzFeed and um, at, at BuzzFeed News. Excuse me. Um, Joel Pavelski. He's the director of programming at Mike. Um, and we are extremely grateful that uh, Raquel Ricard is here with us. She's the politics and culture editor at Latina Magazine and Latina.com and also an NYU grad. Okay, so there's gainful appointment. It awaits you. Um, <laughs> so anyway, please give our panelists a warm round of applause. Um, what I'm quite, was quite excited when we were conceiving this panel and that we were able to get such great representatives of um, what I like to refer to as the, the new news order. There's a lot of assumptions, especially people who've been in the media business for a long time, my generation, that millennials aren't interested in news, they're not interested in politics. Well, all three of our panelists represent news organizations, I think, that put lie to that. It's just not true and are doing things in a very dynamic, innovative way of storytelling. So I thought maybe a way to kick us off, Joel was kind enough to show us a little of the creative storytelling that he's involved in doing at Mike, and that we take a look, and that might be a good catalyst to our conversation tonight. So Joel, yeah, take so it away. Yeah, so I wanted to give you guys a little example of kind of the creative ways that we're thinking about covering the 2016 election at Mike. We're trying to break it down and uh, try out anything that we can that we think would be illuminating and kind of connect with uh, the younger set, kind of people who are glued to their phones. So you'll notice a couple of things about this video that maybe we can talk about later, um, but it's primed to work with the sound off so that if you watch it on Facebook or on your mobile phone, you can understand everything that's going on without having to hear it. Um, some of those kinds of tweaks and things that uh, make it a video made specifically for the social web. But I wanted to start this out with something a little fun and give you guys an actual visual of what some of the things that we're working on look like. This is a video that explains the process of the Iowa caucuses, which are now over, but hope you enjoy it anyway. The Iowa caucus is crucial to determining the next president of the United States, but it barely makes any sense. Presidential nominees in both major parties aren't selected by voters, they're selected by delegates, basically cronies for their candidate. But before any of that, delegates are selected in each state, starting with Iowa. That's what the caucus is for, but that's not the complicated part. The complicated part is how it works. So, how does a caucus work? A caucus is normally held in a big public building, like a high school. Iowa is broken up into 1,681 precincts, and each precinct holds its own caucus. Well, two actually, a Democratic caucus and a Republican caucus. A Republican caucus is relatively straightforward. It's a lot like normal voting. First, representatives for each candidate give speeches trying to win over supporters. Then, everyone in the room secretly selects their preferred candidate on a slip of paper. The votes are then collected and tallied. Democratic caucuses are more complicated. They have someone called the precinct captain. The precinct captain gathers everyone in one big room and counts exactly how many people are there. The crowd then divides into preference groups. You're basically lumped with the people you agree with, and unlike a normal election, everyone else can see who you support. Then there's this thing called the viability threshold. This is where things get crazy. If your group isn't big enough, usually 15% of people in the room, you have to convince others to leave their group and join you. If you don't reach 15%, you could either join another group or get out. And from there, delegates who could determine the party's nominee are sent on to the next phase of the process. There are about 3 million people in Iowa. That's less than 1% of the U.S. population. But the Iowa caucuses are important simply because they come first, and that's why everyone should care about them. Like the rest of our political process, it's a mess. But understanding it means understanding who does, and who doesn't, have a shot at being the next president of the United States. Uh, 
obviously a diff di <laughs> excuse me, a different kind of storytelling. Um, Joel, maybe you can talk about the genesis of that piece and how it might your approach in covering what is a very unusual election. <laughs> Yeah, so I think at Mike we just kind of fire on all cylinders. Uh, we're trying to do anything and everything we can on just about every platform. Um, and breaking down each one to understand why people go there, what it is that they're down to consume, and making sure that there's a very healthy feedback between uh, kind of the signals from the audience, which we think is what the data is, what it tells us every day, and uh, how we can tweak our process and understand what's working and what's not. Um, so. Applying that process to the 2016 election means uh, for us experimenting with new platforms uh, uh, in distributed ways like Google AMP, Facebook Instant Articles, Facebook Live Video, Periscope. We've had a lot of our correspondents at um, caucuses and primaries and debates and rallies across the country, um, kind of giving people a live window into what they're seeing and talking to supporters of particular candidates. Um, immediately and then going straight to say Twitter or their Facebook pages to answer questions. It's kind of about um, being as nimble as possible and uh, hitting everything we can, seeing what people really enjoy and doing more of that and uh, not repeating stuff that sucks. <laughs> you said right up top about this piece that it sounds like, and, and, and I'd like both of you to address this as well, that you kind of know where your audience is and where they're getting your news. So one of the first things you said was you want this to be able, if somebody's looking in on the phone, they don't, you can just watch it. You don't have to listen to it. Yeah, I lied to you guys, actually. That was the one made for YouTube, not the one made for <laughs> Facebook. So I, I, I imagine there were some confused looks being like, I can't watch this with the sound off. This doesn't make any sense, because it wouldn't. But there are about six different versions of that video, one made for Facebook with a lot more text on the screen that's a little bit shorter, because we kind of found a window that works best on Facebook. One square version for Instagram, those kinds of things. And so we kind of try to... I guess, in a way that's more applicable to you guys, we try to find people who um, are nimble to not only um, understand how to creatively attack a subject and come up with a creative idea, but then also be the person who's editing it, be the person who's helping write the script. Um, anybody who has kind of multiple proficiencies is, is um, a priority for us. Yeah. I've, I've got to think that's true. And wow, you've got mobile under. Your yeah. domain. Right. Um, I mean, a lot of what Joel was just talking about is kind of what we at BuzzFeed like to refer to as a distributed model of um, telling stories. So basically, that means that you have a lot of platforms at your disposal to tell a story. You have Snapchat, you have YouTube, you have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, so on and so forth. And historically, a lot of organizations, I think, approach those places as like, I have this one style of storytelling that I'm just going to plop everywhere and see how it does. Um, instead, the goal is actually to look at what are the unique ways of storytelling for those individual platforms and adapt the story that you're trying to tell to that audience itself. Um, so for us, it's a lot of questions about, you know, if we do a post about, you know, a viral moment on a campaign trail or something like that, or a more creative post that has like a character in a comic, can that character in the comic become a YouTube video? Can that YouTube video then become an Instagram post? Can that Instagram post then become something that is like shared on Facebook Live if we have to do like an interview with that character or something like that. So um, as it applies to 2016, I think we're just looking for different ways to optimize those platforms as they come along, as opposed to just saying, you know, we're just going to throw things everywhere and just <laughs> hope for the best and see, see how it goes. See what sticks. Yeah. 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 yeah I mean, uh, how much does that, that play out at, at Latina? It's a little bit different than yeah. your former place of a board. Yeah. Things are a little different at Latina. Um, I actually, Latina if, is a women's magazine. And so we were print for a long time, and we went digital a few years ago. Um, and so for a long time, it's been primarily entertainment, beauty, and fashion. And I was brought on um, less than a year ago to really uh, do content around um, uh, politics and culture. So I have just been playing around with different things and trying to understand what, our, what works for our readers. Um, and so what I've found, uh, what works is focusing more on the issues um, versus like the actual campaign trail, um, and also making and finding like that that culture aspect uh, to it. So like funny memes uh, that deal with some of the candidates, but that also like allude back to like Selena Quintana, <laughs> Selena like a Selena song or a Selena video. 
um, or something like a telenovela, like something that's like really funny and it's gonna get like something familiar to our readers, but also something that they can comment on uh, about the about the election so far. I think that kind of speaks to something that yeah. media discovered for me last year, kind of in 2015, maybe 2014, but it is that, um, and I don't mean to be crass about this in any way, but um, that, because I know that when you say issues, you're talking about things that are very deeply felt by people yeah. and impact their daily lives. Yeah. But I think the media kind of under started understanding that issues are almost kind of like a cheat code for um, uh, identifying and speaking to an audience. Like, they're, they're very... <laughs> Um, uh, because these are people that organize themselves around um, things that they think about the world or personal identities that they hold mm -hmm. in their daily lives. And if you can authentically um, report on stories that matter to them or um, you know, find ways that speak to that particular identity or people who care about that particular issue, there's a built-in um, audience kind of waiting for you um, who's hungry for the things that you could be producing. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting, too, that if how much of it, in a way, are you, as you go about this and you're reporting these issues, these important issues, how much are you saying, to your point, Joel, this is my audience. How am I going to reach them, in the, in the, engage them, really? The word really is engagement. Some thoughts? Yeah, I, well, I think there's... Um a part of it is definitely understanding sort of the people who are telling the stories and the lens through which you're telling it. Um, I know that there is a, you know, a lot of conversation going on this year around like the Oscars and diversity, and it really applies to a lot of industries as well, where you know specific issues of interest to certain racial groups or demographics, um, you know, people I guess understand sort of where these stories come from and the back story behind it. So you can kind of tell when someone is telling you a story about themselves or about you that's you know, not really told through a lens that understands you or sees the things that you understand or the context that you understand. Um, so I think one of the goals, at least for, for our newsroom, is to never feel like, to never have one person feel like they have to be an ambassador for an entire race of people or an entire <laughs> sect of people or an entire group of people. Um, we really do pace, place a high premium on making sure that we're hiring for a diverse newsroom so that you know, if someone who wants to cover Latina issues or black, you know, quote unquote black issues or whatever, um, feels open and free to do that, but there doesn't have to be like the one black person in the newsroom has to be the person who does those things all the time. So, um, and then from there, thinking about platforms and mobile and Facebook, um, there are people who spend a lot of time who their obsession is finding out how do we get these stories then to that audience. You look like you want to jump in, Joel. Sure. Um, I mean, I think when you say engagement, it's just kind of a buzzword for saying this, that someone is giving an electronic indication that this matters to them or that they care about this or sharing even mm -hmm. um, that BuzzFeed talks about a lot. Um, kind of somebody that's just a way of them recording and attaching the content that you're producing to their kind of identity online and saying, like, this is super important to me. And that's why, um, to your point, uh, diversity isn't important just at the reporting levels of an organization, but also at the decision makers. Um, that's something that at Mike we were uh, kind of really tackling over the past six to nine months is making sure that you know there were women and minorities and you know people of color and everybody represented, not just in the people who were writing the stories, but people on the board and people who were in the meetings deciding what stories get told. And, um, and I think that has to kind of be addressed too. This is sort of a, a chicken and egg question, a toss up here. The, um, we were chit chatting a little before we started the session about this election year. And, and I mentioned you know, that your or news organizations are putting lie to, the, to this idea that millennials and young people are not engaged, not interested in news, not interested in current events. Um, and you're finding the language to, to, to reach a, a, a very special audience. Um, how much, you know, I guess it's what comes first, if you will. We've seen uh, two candidacies, the real surprises, upstart candidacies with lakes. I mean, um, certainly on the Republican side, Donald Trump, and on the Democratic side, Bernie Sanders. How much does, in a sense, that you're giving voice to a lot of people who really never had voice, um, how much do you think that's had to do with where we are in terms of this presidential campaign? That's an interesting question. When I think startup, I think of Donald Trump, of course. <laughs> um, 
I don't know, I want to address something you mentioned earlier, actually, about how people actually find those stories and you know, millennials not being interested in news. The first piece I think that's most important is ease of access before anything else. A lot of sites and platforms and organizations are just now catching up to being mobile friendly. And before that, if any of you are like using Safari on your iPhone, like when the iPhone first came out, it's like a rage fest. It makes <laughs> you want to like throw your phone across the room and just never be on a phone on a mobile site for a newspaper ever again. Um, and this is a very recent development that I think those stories became accessible to people. And I think that in that space of things not being accessible to younger people who are actually using phones to get information, I think some organizations interpreted that as millennials not being interested because they weren't going there, because it wasn't mobile friendly and it wasn't user friendly. I don't think that young people are not interested in news. I think they're frustrated by the fact that it can't get to them in the places they want to get it. Um, I don't think that young people and millennials want to be talked down to. I don't think they want news to be you know, boiled down or dumbed down in a certain way. I think they want it to be explained and they want it to be like contextualized, but I think people want the full story as well. Um, and people sometimes look at you know, uh, ways of storytelling like that, and they, they call something like that video dumbed down. That's not, that's a very good explainer very of, like, of what yeah. the caucuses are like. Um, it's just done in a way that is optimized for YouTube or for Facebook or for whatever other platform is out there. Um, so, if there's yeah. one way, like you, like if you want to piss me off, say like your, say like some content is like being dumbed down for a certain audience. Like that just works my nerves. <laughs> <laughs> um, because a lot of what I do can't be called that being dumbed down. But I don't see my writing, my reporting as that. It's a different language, right? Um, my audience, very much like myself are working class people of color, and we talk differently. And that doesn't mean that we talk less intelligent, that just means we talk differently. And so uh, speaking to that audience in an authentic way is under, understanding that language, understanding the Spanglish involved in that, so switching uh, between English and Spanish and then creating English, like creating like Spanish words that with an English, or creating like English words with a Spanish accent, like, <laughs> but like where the community understands that. And uh, not being afraid to use slang, not being afraid to, uh, what I, I see a lot of what I do, and um, I see a lot of what I do is like, like hood politics. <laughs> or like hood feminism, yes. um, <laughs> and so and that's and those are my readers too, and so like they completely understand that, and they're completely, they are as we say in you know in these spaces like woke, right? They understand, um, but it's a different language because they're not interested in what, you know, un, what CNN has to say because that's not, that's not being directed to them. That doesn't mean that they don't care about the issues or you know the matters at hand, but. So yeah, definitely. Responses, I think, to both of those. On the first, that millennials don't care about news or yeah. need it created differently for them. And then second, that they need it somehow dumbed down uh, or less intelligent. I think on the first point, going back to what Aaron said, is um, I used to have a boss. I won't name names, but it was when I was working in uh, old school newspapers. You can name them. That <laughs> <laughs> um, I always used to tell um, millennials uh, aren't bad at news, they're better at it than you are. Yeah. Um, they just don't have time to wait around for you to figure out how to deliver it to them. They've already gotten it from Twitter, they've already gotten it from whatever email chain they're on. They're, they're on purple, they're like reading the BuzzFeed news app, they're you know on the Mike newsletter and they're 10 steps ahead of you. So Mike doesn't necessarily try to make news differently for millennials. We believe, number one, that millennials read differently because they understand platforms and are smart and technologically savvy. So we want to meet them on those platforms and sometimes get there before they do. Um, and then that they think about the world differently, um, see issues differently, think in some cases things like gay marriage aren't really a a debate to be had anymore, those kinds of things. And then on the second point um, about whether millennials need news dumbed down, I think our constant challenge is actually not with making news that's smart enough, it's in figuring out how to atomize stories and uh, write something that's giving you all of the important information in a short kind of atomic unit of content. So like, 
it's just like what people would say in writing class about writing a letter. It's harder to write something concise and clever and short than it is to go on for five pages. And news is exactly the same. It's more difficult to figure out what the 26 words are that you put in a breaking news alert to give everyone all of the context that they need than it is to sometimes to just bloviate for eight paragraphs. In terms of your education, we have a number of students here tonight, what were the important things that you did or that you got from if, if you know, if you were an undergrad or you were to do it all over again, mm -hmm. given that you all now occupy jobs, as you said, didn't exist? Um, I would say uh, three things. One, the newspaper at my school, student newspaper, was the like end all be all of my experience, pretty much. I pretty much like to say that I majored in the Ithaca and not really in journalism. Uh, I spent my days, my nights, my weekends, all my time there as a staff writer, as an editor, as like a really terrible photographer at one point. Like, God bless you, you're probably a lot better than I'm doing right at that point. <laughs> but um, just like in a lot of different facets and different you know, places. So I got to just get a sense of what I liked and what I didn't like. Uh, two, that leadership experience that I got from working on the paper was really, was really valuable. And three, I'd say just the, the time to spend with internships over the summer, like having sort of a regimented, now you're out of school, you have a summer to do stuff, which you could spend like chilling, doing nothing. You could spend, you know, at an internship um, somewhere. Um, classes and things like that were good, but it was the hands-on experience that really painted the, the, whole, the whole experience for me, for sure. Yeah. I was very privileged actually to have some, like all of my professors were really great and they were always like on their game um, and allowed us to take classes, like there weren't tracks, like we were able to do, you know, reporting courses as well as the multimedia courses and the graphic design. So I left with a lot of skill sets. Um, so I was very, very lucky to have that. I mean, now I feel like that's the direction a lot of uh, journalism um, programs have taken, but 2000, Eight, two thousand, like ten, like not so much. So I was just very, very lucky um, to 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 have that experience. But also, again, my college newspaper. Um, that's where I really. That's where I really. I I got my beat, and it's something that I stuck with for a really long time. And I made my name as a college newspaper. Like that's how. So that when I was starting, you know, to apply to different places, or you know or like freelance, like people already knew what I was about. People already like could, could see my name and point it to something. Like they know, you know, this is what Raquel covers. This is the lens that she's covering it through, you know. So it was great. I was able to, I don't like to say the word brand, but I, I was able to really like, uh, you know, build my brand as a college reporter. Yeah, I think um, I've, Probably three main things I would say uh, that I took out of college that have served me really well since then. The first is like something that everybody beats you over the head with, but it's you know the basics of being a reporter. Um, you know, actually picking up the phone and going to talk to people face to face and asking someone to spell their name three times and making yeah. sure that you get every detail right like that goes a really really long way. And even people in you know new media, uh, millennials and these digital organizations will um, you can't really teach like kind of that gut news sense also. Um, I think that like understanding what has news value and what doesn't will never change regardless of the platform and um, just getting that down um, as much as you can, mostly probably by working with your student paper um, rather than necessarily learning it in a class. I think it's something that you just learn by doing. Yeah. You know, I, and I, I have a feeling I kind of maybe know the answer to this too. Um, I'm sure there are people in the audience here tonight who are thinking about what makes somebody, when they get into that entry-level job, or they're an intern, how they shine, how they stand out. And maybe you guys could, could give us a, a couple, couple of tips, quick tips. Um, I think that, so when I was interning uh, like at the fellowship for the, for the Times, it was really difficult because there's this massive organization with a lot going on, and I constantly felt like I was, shouldn't have been there. Like I was this like little annoying black boy from Queens <laughs> who somehow like snuck into the building and someone like forgot about him or something. And I was like, guys, you, maybe you meant like the Aaron from Harvard or something. Like it wasn't really <laughs> the right person. Um, but like once I got over that feeling and I just like put my head down and worked, people noticed that and took like, it, it didn't take, you know, walking around and talking to people and networking with people I was there. They were interested in the work that I had to do. And it's very overwhelming, I think, sometimes 
with internships like that at big places because you're, the impetus that you might feel is to go and network immediately and to talk to as many people as you want to talk to and to just like get to know your people. And that's, that's important. There's an element that is important there. But if you leave that 10-week internship or that 12-week experience with nothing to show for it, it's not going to help you at all. Like you can sit down in front of me and say that you want a job at BuzzFeed News and I'm going to ask you like, what did you do during your 10 weeks at CBS? And if you say, well, I met Scott Pelley and he was really nice. Um, <laughs> he really liked my sweaters. Um, really big hit. Um, I emailed Katie Kirk one time. She got back to me. It was really exciting. And I'm going to be like, OK, but like, what did you actually report on? What did you do? And if you have nothing to show for it, I'm not going to hire you. Um, so that is one of the biggest things, is like putting your head down might feel like you become invisible. It might feel like you become like someone who's not really being paid attention to, but then there's always going to be someone who's looking at what you're doing and is whispering to the hiring manager and saying, hey, yeah. like Sarah's actually working right now and she's you know, busting her ass right now. We should you know, hire her when the time comes or something like that. So put your head down, focus on the work. Yeah, agreed. Um, focusing on the work, being a go-getter. Um, you don't have to be like perfect at everything. You're not going to be perfect at everything. But to have some sort of understanding of different platforms, of the way to use uh, different technology, the way to, to sh do different forms of storytelling is so important. Um, when I was at Mike, and like Liz, <laughs> Liz would, Liz does so much, especially she did, she did so much at Mike, like more than you know. Um, and so she was always like, you know, you know, I want to do this, but I don't, I don't have the skills to, to do this video or to do this graphic or whatever. And I'm like, I could do it. And she's like, are you serious? Like, you could do it? And so it turned out, like, I was actually, I started as an intern. There was no, they weren't hiring interns at this, at the time. And this was at Mike. This was at Mike. Um, they were not hiring interns at the time. And I was hired because of that, because I was able to do all those things that, um, that, you know, Liz didn't think we're able to get done. I was like, I can do that. Or if I can't do that, I'm going to figure out how to do that. Um, trust me. Like, give me a day or give me a few hours. Like, I'm going to get it done. And she's like, whoa, OK. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it, and it got done. Um, yeah. yeah there's, I think there's an element to that that's like, do the work. Yeah. There's also an element to that that's like, have balls and don't be bashful. Yeah. And, and say, like, OK, maybe this could be better if we tried it this yeah. way. When you're in an internship role, you don't really have a whole lot to lose because they like yeah. if they just won't listen to you. If like if they think you have a bad idea, like it's just gonna go totally ignored. So you don't have a whole lot to miss out on by just throwing yourself out there and really trying to offer some creative suggestions. I think that yeah. that like in addition to doing your like day-to-day -day work actually really shows. Yeah. Um, other than that, I would say probably that my number one advice for somebody when I get a resume, I would say like Understand that like you right now can be a practitioner of your art regardless of whether someone else gives you the okay. Like there's never been a time like this in media before. The biggest change in the past 20 years is essentially that there were these once these huge gatekeepers that existed at the Wall Street Journal and at CNN and everywhere um, that would say whether or not your story got in front of people because they owned audiences. They don't own those audiences anymore. They belong to you. They belong to everybody who wants to jump on the internet and and attract audiences with great shit. And you can do that anytime you want, and that's what I go looking for anytime I see somebody's resume. Like, is this person out there um, all over Twitter, all over Instagram, telling stories? You know, an Instagram photo can be an act of journalism. Mm -hmm. um, if it's a picture of somebody with their quote underneath, you know? Um, I'm looking for somebody who is so hungry to tell stories and actually um, experiments and gets their hands dirty, and you can do that with the platforms that are out there available to you. Uh, so don't be precious, don't be afraid. Get out there, make some mistakes, and learn from them, and put stuff on the internet is what I would say. That's the number one thing. All right, we've got some questions. We've got a microphone up here. Hi, I'm Gavin McCormick. I teach journalism at Queens College. And uh, I don't know a lot about your businesses, but I understand that in the editorial room, there's probably a person or multiple people who are dealing with the data all the time, uh, you know, your readership, your viewership, et cetera. And I'm wondering about the tension between maintaining your editorial voice as a publication and responding to the data so that you're changing. I understand from people I've talked to that people, that organizations like yours are changing stories all the time because they find nobody's listening, nobody's watching, nobody's reading it, so we've got to change it. And I wonder about the tension between maintaining your voice and not just going, chasing the data, chasing the readership so that you're just doing cat videos. Mm -hmm. 
That's really interesting. I think that's a daily challenge for us. And you're right, we have uh, uh, kind of an analytics department, people who are tasked with watching the data that you get from the internet and kind of translating it for everybody else uh, who works there and what it means, what the signals are that the audience is trying to tell us. I think that you want your decision making to be informed and not dictated by data. So obviously there's always a role, um, especially from our editorial leaders in determining what our coverage is supposed to be. But I also think that um, you, you're, we've learned a little bit that you're kind of training your audience and building the audience with the content that you're creating as, as you grow. Um, and so it's not necessarily that um, our Facebook audience, for example, hates cat videos. They hate cute animals, which is like, <laughs> it doesn't exist on the internet. Like they, we cannot make things that are like a silly, adorable, like dying dog across the United States. Like it doesn't work for us um, because I think we've actually trained them to expect a certain kind of thing from us and it is exactly the kind of thing that we want to be creating. Um, and so I think both of those things go hand in hand. One, trust your editorial leaders to make editorial decisions sometimes uh, that may seem counterintuitive and then um, understand that if you don't have an audience yet that you want, uh, you may have to take some time to grow it by creating the content that they're looking for. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Jackson Evans. I just graduated from Oberlin College and I work with the Center for Communication, I suppose as a journalist of sorts. Um, and my questions are regarding Facebook specifically as a platform for, and, and I've seen it kind of evolve into this pseudo news website. And at least if you look at my Facebook feed, Bernie Sanders is gonna be the president, without a doubt. Um, and I think not, that hasn't worked to educate me. So, so what, why is Facebook playing such a huge role in, in, in all these different companies, companies that you guys work for? Is there any apprehension about Facebook specifically and its role in journalism and news? Well, I think that's by design. I think Facebook is trying to get you to use it for every part of your life, and you're going to see that happening a lot more this year, especially with them releasing developer tools on the Messenger platform at F8. Um, so not just Facebook, the website, but Facebook Messenger is going to become a huge part of the way that you use your mobile phone uh, this year. And hopefully news organizations will have some cool ideas for how that works into your life as well, but we'll see. Um, I think like Facebook obviously is a juggernaut on the web, on the social web. I think that the reason we think of it that way is because it's so good at data, is that it makes it clear exactly how much traffic it's sending to publishers, and so publishers give it an outsized importance in kind of the realm of where they think their stories get viewed and shared. So I think, I don't know, a lot of that is, a lot of that is PR, a lot of it is true just because Facebook is a juggernaut. We try to diversify our traffic sources, but we kind of like a little bit trust that um, people and see in the numbers that like there are whole communities on Tumblr also sharing our stuff that may not have the same um, scale but are just as important to us because they're reading a particular kind of stuff on our site um, and those kinds of things. Hey, how are you? I'm Francesca. I have a <clears throat> bit of a cold, so my voice is not normally this low. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a broadcast journalist. I've been a TV news anchor and reporter for the last 15 or so years. Um, and I'm currently a freelance uh, special correspondent for PBS NewsHour. So I have a couple questions. One is, uh, I don't know the digital the digital world the way you do. Clearly, I have my Twitter, Facebook, you know, whatever accounts. But I I don't organically have it as part of my lifestyle uh, in terms of Snapchat, for example. So the question is basically, one, is it worth to you know try to go back to school to do something uh, and learn those skills? And number two. <clears throat> what advice might you have for someone such as myself to potentially shift into a role of working for one of your organizations like Mike or BuzzFeed uh, with a lot of journalism experience? Um, or is there a place or not for that? The, I think the, the concept for a lot of platforms that you mentioned is that they should be easy to use from a user perspective. So for Snapchat, if it's difficult for like a user to use, it's not a good product. So don't think that you need to be a whiz on all these platforms in order to work in the rooms that actually make the decisions around it. If you're someone who just is inherently visual, like a broadcast journalist is inherently visual, and you understand what a good visual entails, play around with those platforms and play around with those tools and learn how to adapt those things to those tools and ask really critical questions about what could be better. What's the next step for this thing? And chances are somebody in a boardroom somewhere or somebody in a tech brainstorm has asked that same question that you've asked, but they've asked it in such a complicated way that no one really knows how to answer it. 
So if you have that perspective, I think it's actually very valuable. Real quick on that. Um, there's a lot of space, I think, uh, like you mentioned, for people who might be applying kind of things that they learned as a broadcast journalist to kind of the biz dev side or kind of understanding platforms and how to tell stories on new platforms. Um, there's kind of a misconception that you have to be on every one. Like you don't need to jump on Snapchat if you hate Snapchat. Right. Um, you know, pick the two that are worth your time and build audiences there. You don't need to go back to school necessarily. Just be a practitioner of um, the spaces that you want to tell your stories in, uh, regardless of whether or not you're getting an outlet to do them for you. And also, you're in a really great position right now because everybody's talking about video, especially live video, with Facebook Live and Periscope, and not just media organizations, but Facebook and Twitter themselves. And my conversations with them, they're really going to be pushing it really hard this year, and everybody's kind of looking for someone who understands uh, live broadcast journalism, someone who understands how to put a package together. And I think you can take those things and kind of pitch it to someone and sell it and say, um, uh, if you get the right person to get you, know, you in the door, say, this is how I can help you understand that new platform. Hi, I am Victoria Hernandez. I am a student, a journalism student at Manhattan College. And <clears throat> my question is, how do you get the creativity if you look at other competition or if you try to stay like in, with your own originality in terms of like the content that you guys create? I think this kind of goes back to when we were making comments about hiring and about diversifying newsrooms in general. I think we're very much used to a unified and like singular perspective in news, and that is pretty much of like white straight men, um, and it gets kind of boring, honestly. So, <laughs> uh, so I think that when you put the work into hiring a diverse newsroom and diversity, not just meaning of race, but of gender, of thought, of background, of religion, of <laughs> like disability, everything like that, those all those factors play into things. But age. An age, <laughs> an age, definitely, sorry about that, um, and age. Uh, I think when you create a robust newsroom that plays, you know, plays into all those different types of diversity, I think you'll get more diverse voices and um, more original, original ideas. And uh, there is definitely this, this jockeying around of the same perspective that, you know, if, you know, I think before when it was just the, the same pillars of like the New York Times, CNN, and Washington Post all doing the same story over and over again. There's always going to be that element of like, you know, when news breaks and there's a hardline news story, everyone kind of does the same thing. That's just like the breaking news of the day, like the moment. But beyond that, the perspectives that I think different types of journalists can bring, I think it really starts at hiring and recruiting people. I also think on a personal level, you have to have a bias for action. Um, kind of just jump out there um, and try something because I think you can sit in a room and try to come up with new creative ideas, but once you step outside of that room and go talk to people who might be a part of your story or actually kind of like hit the pavement or even just jump on Twitter and like tweet a couple of people who might, be, might know more about it than you do, it kind of generates ideas. And it also, whether um, you're trying something that's going to work or not going to work, you're going <laughs> to learn something from it. Um, so we like to say we have a bias for action. And instead of kind of sitting somewhere and thinking, what is my new creative idea, we'll jump out and, and Ask a random stranger on the street, what's a creative idea? Like, what's a story that isn't being told? Um, just kind of expanding your, um, your view a little bit and actually jumping out of your comfort zone. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lena Young. I'm a graduate of St. Joseph's University, where I majored in English and Communication Studies. I'm an aspiring graduate student, but I'm also involved with my family business, which is a car dealership. So with the skills that I've learned through my education, I would like to benefit, help to benefit my family business. But how would you suggest convincing the older generation of the benefits of social media and an online presence to attract a millennial audience? Uh, show them numbers. I mean, <laughs> uh, if you can find three or four businesses that are in direct competition with your family's business, that do have those social platforms and are either starting conversations on their Facebook page or getting people to like retweet them or just any instance. Because if you just get them to you know let, let, let you run free, that's all you really need is the, is the go ahead to do it. And once you do that, then just use everything you learn and be creative and just don't let them be a gatekeeper to everything that you make a decision around. Let them give you the freedom to do it. Before we close, you know, we did build this as you know, the new news order and the 2016 election. Talk about some great stuff. Just quickly, we close. Um, here, the, 
if you know, we want to be informed voters engaged in this democracy, we kind of want to be our own media critics. Um, this is a fascinating campaign. I'd like just maybe a piece of advice from each of you in your own way here in which organizations and personally maybe involved in covering issues of Ralph, uh, involved, in, revolving, involved in this campaign. Some advice you give. You've got to keep it brief because we've got to close out here. Hmm. Yes, sir. Um. <laughs> <laughs> advice, advice for covering this election. <laughs> For covering you know what, it or I, for like Covering it and, and following it. And following it. And where you, how you get your news and, and how you stay informed with all the noise. Right? I will say that gone are the days where we can cover one, like, one topic every few months. Right? Like, if a story is doing good, we're going to tackle that story in every angle possible. Right? And so I would say... Um, Look at the news sites that you're, that you're really interested in, that you want to write for. Follow them on social and see what's getting the retweets. See what's getting a lot of the shares. Because um, you know that that's, that's what they're interested in. And then, like, because you know that that's what's doing well for them. And so pitch them a story on theme, but an angle they haven't covered before and an angle someone else hasn't covered before. Try not to take everything that you see at face value that's being shared around. I think that, unfortunately, we're in a cycle right now where, because it's become a bit of a circus a on bit? a bit of a circus, <laughs> um, I, I pride myself on no one really knowing my politics. I'm trying to be like a little bit careful here. Um, I think because of that, the nature of the campaign right now and how fast it's moving, it's very easy for facts to kind of trickle through and not really become valuable anymore. Um, there was, this, there was this moment, I think, the Republican debate where Fox was like superimposing a lot of facts while Donald Trump was speaking about um, how he would fund certain things he's proposed and things like that. And it was like a sort of active fact-checking of what was happening on stage. Um, and I think that the fact-checking process used to be more prevalent, I think, after the fact. Like you'd see people would like, you know, do a, a next day fact-check of what was said in the debate the, night, the day before that. And we didn't really see too much of that. So as a journalist and as a consumer, I would encourage you guys to seek out those fact checks of those things happening because uh, it's very easy, I think, to perpetuate things that might not really make sense and might not actually be based in fact as you cover a campaign that is, you know, one of the most, you know, crazy campaigns that I think we've seen in a, in a while. Um, so, yeah, be really solid on your facts before you go about covering things, especially from like a freelance and independent perspective. If you don't have an organization behind you supporting you with editorial support, and you're on your own, kind of making your own pitches and making your own decisions about what you're going to cover, really make sure that you're buttoned down on, on the realities of what candidates are saying can happen versus what can actually work in our financial systems and things like that. Yeah, I mean, I guess if I have advice for covering and following the election season, it's just don't check out because it's the circus that it is. <laughs> and I would just urge you to fight <laughs> that proclivity because um, we need you guys, as journalists, to like actually tell people the truth. Um, the political process is very much still playing out. Like this is yeah. a legitimate election that is happening. Like it's still uh, <laughs> we're still choosing the leader of the free world. So. Yeah, uh, this is so, a change. Just a little bit of encouragement. Keep doing what you're doing. Terrific. I think there's been a lot of encouragement in this conversation tonight, and I want to thank all three of you. Great conversation. Well,